Good morning, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea Tranquility. Welcome to another edition of Friday Morning at the Fun House with Martin Popoff. Today, we've got another really cool show theme for you. Good morning, Martin. How are yes, you? Yes, morning, Pete. Doing okay. Doing okay. Ready to roll. Cool. <laughs> we're, uh, we're on this kind of cover art thing, as you guys have <laughs> noticed. Uh, there seems to be an endless supply of topics that we could cover dealing with cover art. So today's one we haven't done before. So what about that album cover that you saw on the rack back in the day when we went to record stores? You never heard of the band before, but that cover art was so cool. You took a chance. You went home. You put it on your turntable and you hit a home run. Right. That doesn't always happen. Uh, so I guess great album cover art. Turned out to be great. Didn't know the band, whatever we're going to ultimately title this when we actually post this on YouTube. Uh, well, that remains to be seen, but that's the theme. So we've each picked out five. We got a couple honorable mentions. I'll have Martin kick us off with his uh, first choice. Yes. Yeah, so one qualification cover art uh, to me, I part of my stories has to include the back cover art as well. So true. It's, good. It's front good and back, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, uh, all right. So my first choice, um, I went with um, Budgie Bandolier. There you go. Um, so this is an interesting situation. So, so, uh, Spokane, Washington was where we got our records and there were these two great hippie store. There's uh, magic mushrooms and strawberry jams, right? They both went through a couple different locations. I got this at the original location. Um, I believe this was a new release. So I would have been 12 years old at the time, 1975. Um, uh, and I saw that and it absolutely blew me away. And it, it was like one of our just standard, okay, got a risk on this, have no idea. That's what we called it. Got a risk. Did you, did you buy a risk today? Right. Sort of thing. Right. <laughs> um, but then I remember turning it over and, uh, and not being particularly pleased by the signals uh, that I got off this, the band look really kind of uh, nerdy, you know, they, they've got uh, the lead singer is, uh, is your, is your basically your Getty Lee total uh, prototype there in, in Burke Shelley. Uh, everybody's dressed kind of, uh, you know, Tony looks kind of country and Western. That was kind of his style. And the song titles were really weird. Like the song titles have a little bit of that idea of, um, you know, when the Black Sabbath guys talk about how we had to split up the songs so you got more royalties and all this kind of yeah. thing. It was kind of a complicated story. But the songwriter song titles were really weird on this. Um, but yeah, the front cover like made you think this is a pretty stunning thing. It doesn't exactly scream heavy metal, but maybe it does. It's got guns, you know, guns always helps. Right. Uh, so, yeah, took this one home from Spokane. You know, Spokane is a two and a half hour trip back and you go through the border and all that kind of stuff and got it home. And uh, it was pretty cool. Budgie was uh, Budgie was, uh, you know, now now in our uh, in our preferred bands list. And I just wanted to mention uh, as as an adjunct to this story. So I I um, had started keeping I'm not sure if I ever showed this book um on your show before Pete but so so I started keeping this book where um where I I put down all my purchases through the years so, and I I started the book I think in around 77 and kept it up to about 96 and I had all these little codes for when I traded for and I put the store that I got it at at the time and and the neat thing about Budgie is is eventually um kind of the next thing is I think I got if I were Britannia next and wasn't that heavy but then we went on one of these family vacations and I've got noted in the store here like driving across the country in the in the green family camper van I, I got I think I got never turn your back on a friend in Winnipeg and I got um, squawk in the first one at Kelly's in Toronto and this was all in 77 so those early super rare ones came a couple years later but bandolier was uh, was essentially a home run there you go first one wow that's even more obsessive than me i congratulate <laughs> you on that I, I didn't think there was anybody more obsessed with about this kind of stuff than that but uh, than me yeah. but, all right and yeah if you hold up the back of that album cover again mm -hmm. tony looks like he could have been like uh you know second guitar player in marshall tucker band in that shot exactly the yeah cowboy hat and he'd slot yeah. right he's got the little vest and everything crazy yeah wow <laughs> <laughs> all right so here i'm i'm assuming it was probably 80, I don't know, either 81 or 82 when I got this. I don't remember exactly when, but it's it was after I first got Thunder and Lightning. So I saw this in right. Record World in Middletown, New York. It's where I bought most of my yeah. stuff back then. And I remember picking this up and I was like, I mean, if you're a young kid, teenager, right? 
because at the time I was either 15 or 16 years old. And I loved, I mean, obviously this is a homage to King Kong, right? Huge monster fan and all that kind of stuff. I saw this and I was like, that is so cool. I've never heard of this band before. So I pick it up and then to go with the back cover thing you were just talking about, all of a sudden you get all these cool live shots of guys that look pretty hard rocker metal with the long hair, you know, the, the lights and all that kind of stuff. And I'm looking, I'm like, wait a second, John Sykes. I know him. I'm buying this. Yeah. No clue who Tiger the Pantang are. Brought it home. Loved it. Absolute home run. And, uh, you know, of course, would then find out that this is the band he was in right before he joined Then Lizzie. So it all makes perfect sense. Uh, I probably would have bought this anyway, even if there was no picture of John Sykes on the back. But that certainly helped. And I think we talked about this on a, on a past episode. Whenever you threw some cool live shots of a band, either on the front or on the back, I was sold. It's all it took. Yeah. They had yeah. long hair. They got cool guitars and they, they looked like they got attitude. Yeah, I'm buying it. I don't care yeah. what the name of the band is or if I've heard it, not heard it. I'm buying it. So that yeah. was uh, that was an absolute home run for me. It's funny, you know, and I, I looked at the new wave of British heavy metal for this uh, for this concept of yours. And I thought, I don't know if I can pick a new wave of British heavy metal one, because it was almost like it, almost like the interesting part of it would be when you grabbed one of those new wave of British heavy metal albums and you, you were surprised it wasn't good enough. Right. Um, so, so that's where, that's where I had a problem thinking I, 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 I would pick those up and it, it wasn't a surprise by that point because now you had, now you had heavy metal codified as something where, where the album cover screamed heavy metal, the, the clothes, the song titles. So it was supposed to be heavy. So I wasn't surprised uh, in that respect, but, it's funny. I, I could almost think of a few examples now where we could do the reverse of the show and I could bring up five non new wave or new wave British heavy metal ones that did not turn out to be heavy and metal enough. And that was the surprise. It was a surprise of disappointment. So all of mine have that have the mid to late seventies thing where, where it was, it was a grab bag and you really didn't know what was going to happen sort of thing. Right. So, um, all right. So my next choice, um, a bit of a funny story on this one. So, um, this one here, Obscure Canadian Band, Tease. Um, this is uh, On the Loose. This is their second album. And I got this in the, uh, in the basement of a drugstore, Little John's. Uh, so in, in Trail, BC, our little town, there was a, there was a fairly large drugstore called Little John's. Um, and it was like, I guess it was an independent. Maybe it was a chain. But the guy who was running it, I guess, must have been a big music guy. And he opened up the whole basement, filled it with records, right? It was really cool. Um, but the funny story about this is that uh, that guy uh, saw how crazy fans these two little kids were, myself and Forrest too. And he actually had us uh, go over to the competing record store, Kelly's, which was a chain. And I ended up working there eventually. And, and stand there at, at the record racks with a, with a notepad and paper and write down all the titles of the albums they had in Kelly's and bring it back to me. And he paid us to do this as espionage um, for like, what, what, what album should I have in stock if I'm starting a record department? So that was really bizarre, right? And I remember the only other time I ever did espionage was when I was doing my MBA. Uh, one of my profs, I was a TA uh, for, for my master's in business. And one of my profs actually had me go to this company in this industrial area of, uh, of west of well, it would have been east of Hamilton, west of Toronto, and sit in front of this company and and record which which trucks came in and out of this business. It was really bizarre. So so I've done espionage twice in my life, and one one was where I got this record tease. But um, yeah, heavy band shot, band logo. Um, so you're thinking this is going to turn out pretty good. Uh, on the back, uh, you know, there's not much to go on on the back, but it had album title, a uh, song titles like. Uh, Sweet Misery. Uh, I knew, I think we knew at that point, 77, going to have a good time tonight was a cover, maybe not. But the rest of the song tells are not good. Tonight it's me, baby, why can't you? Nobody's fool. Stay here. Every time, never again. So so every time you got those boring, boring words in song titles, you weren't quite sure what was going to happen. It did have Lady Killer and On the Loose. Um, so you thought oh, it's going to be heavy, but but we looked at that band shot and saw, thought, yeah, this this got to be heavy, right? And it turned out heavy. This this is a good heavy rockin', accomplished, well put together album. It's one of those cool Canadian semi rarities of a of a cool heavy Canadian band. Cool. 
Yeah, that's a Candace album cover, right? Yeah. Based on all the criteria we're always talking about. Yeah, yeah. So here, uh, so this album, which I'm sure everybody out there knows, and if you don't, I'd be mighty surprised. <clears throat> when it first came out, none of us knew who the hell they were. They were just a little band out of Boston, right? And uh, yeah, I mean, again, I go back to stuff that I really liked when I was a kid. I loved, you know, spaceships, sci-fi monsters, all that kind of stuff, comic books. I mean, this to me, and it's kind of, it's shaped like a guitar. And at the time I was starting to think that guitars were pretty cool because I was just newly a Kiss fan. This was the first non-Kiss album I ever bought. So mm. for those of you who've been watching the channel, Kiss is the first band I ever got into where yeah. I started buying records. And then I saw this and I was like, don't really know what that was. One of my cousins is like, oh, that, that Boston, that's, that's really good. A lot of people are talking about that. I'm like, I never heard it because at the time they weren't quite yet blasting this all over the airways. It had just come out. So I asked my dad who worked in New York City, he commuted into the city every day. Uh, he had J&R Music World right next to in New York City where he worked right in downtown. And so I asked him, of course, I had my allowance money, right? It's like five bucks for the LP of the day. So I was like, um, can you get me that that Boston album? So he's like, all right, I couldn't wait. You know, so he, whenever I would ask him to pick me up a record, I would wait patiently for him to come home at night from the city with that yellow j &R music bag. Um, and uh, he pulled it out and there it was in all its glory, of course, much bigger than the CD here. You know, you got the whole thing and then the picture of the guys and they look kind of cool. It's kind of a dark shot, right? And then you put it on and it's absolute perfection. And then before you know it, you blink and all those songs are playing all over the radio. Boston's one of the biggest bands in the world. And, you know, how many people, it's, it's one of the best selling debut albums of all time, ranked one of the best debut albums of all time. So obviously I wasn't the only one taking a chance on this little unknown band from Boston. And for all of us, it worked. And I will say, and I've said this before, this is one of those massive, massive albums that really has been overplayed to death that I'm still not tired of. And I can listen to start to finish any day and love it just as much as I did back then. I can't say that about a lot of the other ones that we classify oh. as such, but yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's, I mean, basically love the album cover, cool band name. I'll buy it. I'll take a chance on it. Home run. Yeah. Cool. Little, little side note about that record. I was actually looking up this morning on the RIA search um, because I'm working on somebody's autobiography that I don't, don't want to go into. Um, but, uh, but I was looking it up for uh, something related to that and that album. So it went uh, gold pretty much immediately, platinum pretty much immediately. And then there was, there's this long period where whoever got lazy and didn't bother certifying anything, um, then Don't Look Back comes out in 78 and it got, it was gold and platinum. It shipped platinum. Yeah. Don't look back. And, and that one also, uh, the Big Gulf, they didn't certify uh, the, any of the Boston stuff again until 1986, which I believe is the year the next one comes out, next right? Stage, yeah. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so they went, so they went from 78 all the way to 86 without any certifying, but the Boston album, so, so gold platinum immediately. And in 86, it was certified nine times platinum at that point. So yeah, pretty interesting. Yeah. 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 My, my funny story. I, I, I was thinking when you said that, I love that story about dad coming home with the yellow, yellow bag. Right. And, uh, I don't think I ever had my parents particularly, if I, I can't remember, bring home an album in anticipation, but with dad, it was always the SO power player NHL things that they had at the gas station. And with mom, it was that in 76, a couple of years later, it was the Safeway, you know, super value Safeway, the big grocery store. They had the same thing, these little, these little hockey cards that were folded and perfed into these little things. And she'd bring that back from shopping. You know, it is until I started driving in 82, um, he was my source and he literally, he worked a block away from yeah. that, that store and they had wow. everything. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, occasionally my brother and I would uh, like during summer summers off from school, we would, mm -hmm. you know, one, once a month, we would go in with dad and uh, take the train with him in the morning to go to the city. Mm -hmm. And we'd hang out with him at the office for a little bit. Then my grandparents would come around and we hang out with them. But he would he would literally on his lunch break, he would take us out for a quick bite to eat in Chinatown. And then we would go to J&R. And that yeah. was for me, as like a you know 13-year-old kid, 12, 13-year-old kid, this place was enormous. And like yeah. all these albums. And I was like salivating, right? So whenever I had enough money for, for an album, you know, whether it be a Kiss album or uh, Boston or the band I'm going to talk about next, uh, 
he, he would, I, I would give him the money and he would, I would wait, wait, wait for him to come home with that bag. And I was like, you know, I would, I mean, it was like, you know, the, here comes, here comes the treasure, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And that's kind of cool when you think about it, being a kid and being so giddy to getting yeah. an album. And then, you know, when you start driving, you go to the record shops yourselves, then you can spend hours there just going through everything. So it's, yeah. uh, you know, two totally different scenarios, but the yeah, yeah. Is still the same. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. All right. So, so my next choice, a um, little bit of a two for here, because I realized in looking up my book, these got on the, uh, these were bought on the same trip, but this is the one I remember the story of ACDC, Let There Be Rock. Now, um, so uh, I thought I bought this in Winnipeg on one of those family vacations. So we, we, did, we did three of these family vacations. One was down to um, Mexico and back from BC. And I remember on that one, I got my Black Sabbath Sabotage shirt that people can see. There's this little picture of me as a kid. I've got the Sabotage shirt on that's around. Uh, and then I got a Zeppelin shirt and a, and a Volume 4 shirt. I don't remember what records I got on that one. But, but we went across the country twice. So once... Uh, over like all the way to Halifax, New York City, Montreal, Toronto, back. So we did that in 77, 79. This is a 77 trip. Didn't know who ACDC was at all. Um, so I would have been 14. Um, but it turns out, um, turns out my story's a little, little off because this one I got in Winnipeg. So this was on the way out there. And, um, or it was the other way around Winnipeg on the way back. But this is the one I remember the story of. So, so seeing this for the first time, didn't know who ACDC was, wasn't crazy about the logo. It was okay, but there's something kind of old school about it. But I remember seeing this album cover to this day, 40 whatever years later, I remember thinking this about this album cover. I thought, well, the guitarist is kind of doing something, but the other guys are just kind of standing there. So how heavy could this be, right? These guys look really bored, they right? <laughs> Yeah. And then I turn it over and then, well, there's the guitarist again. So is this kind of some kind of a weird solo project? Like what's going on here? Right. And then you look at the song titles and one of them's called bad boy boogie. Right. And as kids, we thought boogie was that was the red flag word. Like this is going to be British blues boom. It's going to be boogie. You know, it's going to be this long, boring. We hated boogie stuff. Right. Uh, and then the other titles, problem child's pretty cool. Overdose. Wow. Hell ain't, ain't a bad place to be. Yeah, this, this might be heavy. Whole lot of Rosie, though. It's like, I don't know, man. Uh, and then you look at the instruments. It's guitar, guitar, vocals, drums, bass. So you think, oh, okay, this has got a good, good shot at being pretty heavy. So yeah, got the, got this home. Um, but yeah, it turns out, I guess uh, it was a double risk because on the same trip. And so you're, you're driving on these trips and it's like a two week trip and you can't hear any of this stuff. You just, they just right, pile up. Wait. Right. And then you wait till you get them home. And then that's, that's Christmas, right? It's like, it's like you got these handful of albums. I think this on this trip, I might've, I might even got upwards to 10 albums this trip right in a two-week period but uh you get them home and this turned out to be uh the second album of all time that had no mellow songs on it after rainbow rising uh, so so that that rained that and the sex pistols and rainbow rising were the three albums for a long time uh probably until the new wave british heavy metal or motorhead where where they they were what we called perfect albums they had no 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 ballads at all right so yeah, that's that's how the thought process went on ACDC. Obviously, the band had been around for a while, but in Canada and the states, and I don't know what what order they came out in because I, I I keep forgetting that. But either Let There Be Rock is the first album that came out here, or or they they, they you know they snuck in high voltage and then it was Let There Be Rock. But that's that's the release history for us up here, right? Yeah, and I think it was pretty much the same here, if I remember yeah. correctly. Yeah. Yeah, that's I always like that album cover. But yeah, Bond Bond's got this look on his face like uh Angus is doing that shit again. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah. Exactly. That's, that's exactly what he looks like. He looks bored. Let's get this guitar solo over with. Yeah, right? yeah, I got I have nowhere to go. I'm just kind of sitting here trying to look invisible, but yeah, man, I can't yeah. we just play the next song already. <laughs> that, that little guy out front never stops, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh another JNR music story. So this was uh this next album was purchased on a weekend. So uh, my father, myself, and my brother, and my brother's best friend, and his dad, who was also a teacher in the school district we went to, uh, we decided to go into the city on a weekend. I don't, honestly don't remember why, because this is 1977, I believe. Uh, but we went into the city, we went and had lunch, we went to the Statue of Liberty, we did, you know, all sorts of touristy stuff 
things that we had all done before, but you know, we decided to do them with them, right? So we took a took a walk over to JNR Music World once again, and I had a little extra cash in my in my pocket. Uh, the main thing I wanted to get that day was uh, "Love Gun" by Kiss, but I already knew well who Kiss was, right? Yeah. And uh, I walked out with three albums that day. One of them was also Paul McCartney and Wings, Venus and Mars. And the other one was this band. Talk about spaceships. Again, can you tell yeah. I love spaceships, right? <laughs> so Electric Light Orchestra, Out of the Blue. Uh, I saw this cover. It was a double album. It was on sale. Honestly, I don't remember exactly how much it was. It was either $6.99 or $7.99 because their prices were really good at this place. And I look, I'm looking at the back and I'm like, Turn to Stone, uh, Sweet Talking Woman, Night in the City, Jungle, Big Wheels, Mr. Blue Sky, The Whale. Pretty cool album titles, but man... The album, the, the cover art, man, was just like absolutely gorgeous. And it was a double album. And I was like, all right, I'm going to just take a chance on this. Again, don't know who the hell they are. Um, and just absolutely fell in love with it. Very different than the Kiss stuff I was listening to. Very different than that Boston album I talked before. And pretty different than the, the Wing, Paul McCartney Wings. But this is one of those big open it up read along the lyrics and, and I remember being totally mesmerized by every guy in the band uh in the credits they listed all the different instruments they played on every on the album and you know the keyboard player he had like 50 different uh keyboards Richard Tandy you know the violin guys they listed all the different violins they played Jeff Lynn they listed all the different guitars and all that the microphones all that stuff and I remember just like being mesmerized by this it's like and again it goes back to and I know you can you can appreciate this it's like for most people all this information is useless for someone like me give me more i want to know every instrument they played i want to know all the guys who worked on the production and everything i want to know the studios they recorded and I, no information is too much bring it on and i just soaked it all in and I, and I, and an album like this kind of spoiled me for a lot of stuff to come where you would get something and there's nothing there's no lyrics, there's no credits, there's the, you know, you don't know who plays what. And I was like, you know, I want to know it all. And I think uh, Jeff and company gave it to you on this one. Cool. Wicked, wicked. All right. Um, yeah, I've been playing a lot of Yellow lately and Super Tramp, you know, kind of learning these bands even more so than I than I ever did. Obviously, oh, an amazing great. band. Yeah. So, Super yeah. Tramp. Ooh, what a band. Yeah. Okay, so my next one was actually the first one I thought of when you came up with this concept. So the original Sabotage Sirens. Um, so what happened with this? This is another Spokane story, as most of them are. Strawberry Jams, they're in their second location. It's a bigger place. It's got these big plate glass windows. It's all lit up kind of thing. And, um, you know, normally we didn't even look in the domestic section when we went to Strawberry Jams. It was straight to the imports. This is this is the time of the new wave of British heavy metal. It's obviously a little later than that because it's the 83 album, I believe. Yeah, 83. Um, so, uh, you know, the imports were kind of off to a side. The import singles were there. That's also where they kept the Kerrang and the sounds and all the import albums and all the import albums were in the, you know, they were not sealed, right? They, but they had these, you know, the store sleeves on, them. they were all $8.99. Um, but for some reason, maybe I was bored. So I'm, I'm going through the domestic section. I, I suppose we always eventually, you know, went through it, you know, just because you kind of had to make sure you didn't miss anything. And, and so this was sitting over there in the domestic section. And I, I looked at that cover and thought, well, that's a terrible album cover. Um, the, the album title is Sirens. That's pretty cool. And it's got a Judas Priest logo, right? A rainbow logo. So you think, okay, religious writing, this, this could be heavy, right? Turn it over. You got this crazy looking guy here. And you're thinking, oh, this is possibly pretty good. And then I remember looking at the song titles and thinking, Sirens, Holocaust, I Believe, Rage. That's a pretty good side one. Uh, side two, On the Run. Uh, Twisted Little Sister was the one that got me to buy this because I thought, okay, well, they, they obviously know who Twisted Sister is. Um, and they're, and they're even like, so with it, they're, they're going to name a song after this band. So that's pretty cool. Uh, living for the night scream murder out in the street. So I thought, okay, so this is going to be pretty heavy. Um, it wasn't indie though. And at the time you thought with that album cover and, and seeing that it was an indie, you thought, 
there's a really good chance the production can be pretty bad on this because back in the old days, uh, if you were an indie band, it's it's quite possible you had bad production because, uh, and that changed later on because you know technology improved and it got pretty easy to make a make a good sounding album. But back then, you you could be in a crappy studio and uh, and it, it could just turn out badly. But this was recorded at Morris Sound, uh, engineered by Jim Morris. Um, you know, so Tampa. So this is, uh, you know, pre death metal. Yeah. And, uh, and it sounded amazing. I remember getting this. And that's the other thing, John Oliver, Shrieks of Terror, Chris Oliver, Metal Axe, Steve Watchaltz, uh, Barbaric Cannons, and Keith Collins, the bottom end. So, so, you know, by that point, you pretty much know it's heavy. So yeah, I remember getting this home and thinking like the only thing I thought was that uh, this, this could be, it's obviously, it's probably going to be heavy metal, but it could be bad heavy metal and, and the production could, could tank. It could, could be terrible, but it sounded amazing. This is one of the greatest sounding albums ever to be on an indie. It's just so powerful, so much bass and treble and the guitars are molten on it. Um, so, yeah. And, and I often, I often cite the story that I, that, you know, but when I look in this green book, I realize I got a little bit of the timelines off, but I could have sworn I got this home the same time as Savage, Loose and Lethal, one of the one of the unsung massive new oh, wave yeah. British heavy metal albums. Yeah. So that's an 83 album. And this and I thought I thought I got this on the same trip as Ride the Lightning as well, because I remember these three blue album covers. And I even did an episode of History and Five Songs about the blue album covers. Right. Um, but uh, but yeah, so may maybe this was the same time as as the Savage album, which is just incredible, super, super heavy. And this was amazing as well. This was a this was an instant 10 out of 10. We ranked all the albums at the time. This was instant, instant 10 out of 10. And it, and it ranked for a long time as the first album since Sad Wings of Destiny to come out of a baby band and be traditional metal and, and be just like absolutely flat out amazing. To, to me, the three that do that are Sirens. Sad Wings of Destiny and Merciful Fate, Melissa. Um, and then Metallica is a whole different kettle of fish because it's a new kind of music at that point. It's not, it's not as traditional, but yeah, this turned out to be uh, the perfect example for this concept of uh, totally going in blind, coming home, and it just shoots right to the top of your charts. What's funny is I could have also picked that album, but I bought it a year later. And I have the other album cover, which is the oh, green yeah. and black with the actual sirens on the front and not the ship. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I had the same reaction. Uh, I, I bought it, never heard of them before, and I was blown away. Yeah. And yeah. became a Sabotage fan for life. And, and by the way, mine's the, uh, the black vinyl. So it's, this is worth less money than the blue vinyl. There was a blue vinyl version as well, right? Yeah. That's, uh, that's worth kind of double what this one is worth. So uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, exactly. So we're, we're now in a time frame, you know, 83, 84, 85, 82, that sort of thing where I talked about before getting my driver's license and being able to go to the record shops on my own, right? So now I can actually really uh, every week, sometimes multiple times a week, depending on how much money I had to spend uh, from doing side jobs and things like that, right? Um, you had the time to go and really look at stuff. Uh, scour the import racks and what have you. And I remember seeing this album cover and thinking, this has got to be the heaviest band out there. It's the coolest album cover. I love the kind of like Frank Frazetta thing of Sirith Ungol, oh, yeah. King of the Dead. Hold yeah. on, I'm going to pull that out of the jewel case there. I mean, that to me was the coolest thing ever. And, you know, this is a time where you had a lot of bands, you, you know, you just mentioned, um, uh, Merciful Fate, uh, uh, Sabotage, uh, you know, we had those cool Molly Hatchet albums and you know, all this stuff is starting to pop up, the New Wave of British Heavy Metal. And then you have this and then on the back, again, those killer, killer live shots. And, yeah. you know, is it just me or you look at these and you think that this this band is obviously huge already somewhere and we just don't know about yeah. it here in North America. <laughs> yeah. It was never huge, but what a great job they did of making it look all oh, they're playing on this. Yeah, huge good stage. point. Yeah, these yeah. lights. Yeah. Amazing. And then you listen to the album and it's really different and really good. For a lot of people, this was kind of love it or hate it band because uh, Tim's vocals for some people were really, you know, you got you love it or hate it type of thing. But I thought it was, I thought he sounded great. Uh, I thought this album was kind of, it's kind of doomy. It's got that kind of 
weird production right it's kind of retro but it's really heavy the guitar solos are great and it just it has this like menacing feel to it i mean you know adam smasher the black machine i mean these song titles are just great master of the pit king of the dead i mean just uh, so many great song titles and i was sold never heard a lick of it and then i was like oh this is pretty cool and they came out with another one after that that had also had a really cool album cover and then if you went back and found the debut that also had a great album cover so one of those bands that always had really cool album covers it's not like you're ever going to hear this anywhere this stuff was not played on the radio or anything like that not even really covered in the magazines right so you had to take a chance and a lot of us metal fans back then that's all you had right you had those album covers you bought it yeah cool yeah yeah okay uh so so my last choice um this is a bit of an interesting story so um it's this one scorpions virgin killer <clears throat> so so there's the the scorps guys looking like they just uh stumbled out of the desert and they uh and they need some water real bad um but uh so the story behind this one 1976 so uh 13 years old, um, my partner in time in crime, Forrest Toop, uh, again, the other guy who was as obsessed as I was about this music. So we just go downtown to Trail BC, our, our little town. This is not a Spokane trip. So we had Rock Island Tape Center, Kelly's, Union Peters, Little John eventually. So these, these places with pretty decent record departments for a town of 10,000 people, right? Um, but the funny part of this story is, so, uh, so okay, so first off, so, so I buy this. Uh, band name, amazing, Virgin Killer, sounds heavy, turn it over, song titles, not that great, Backstage Queen, In Your Park, Catch Your Train, Pictured Life, but it did have Hellcat, it did have Yellow Raven, uh, a song called Virgin Killer, um, and you looked at the instruments, and there was, there was no red flags there, no flutes, no keyboards, um, you know, just they, they kind of redo the band shot, but looks like at, at this point, maybe they got their water and they aren't going to uh, die of dehydration. Um, but um, so uh, didn't quite, I don't know if it, it, it um, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I guess we noticed it was a German band, all German names, the, the contact address is in Luxembourg. But the funny part of this story is, so it was a double risk day, turned out to be. So I risked on this and Forrest, at the same time bought this yesterday and today uh the debut album right and the funny thing is we get back to his place and uh and throw these records on the old uh yamaha 3020 massive receiver huge receiver they had bose 901s uh beautiful yamaha turntable they had a really high-end stereo and and we're doing our usual assessment of these records and we go through them and uh it, somehow it gets in our mind that uh well, I kind of like your record better. You like my record better. Why don't we just trade? So it turned out to be the very first trade we ever did. And after that, we were trading records combined with tennis rackets, hockey cards, uh, 45s. We, we had these massive complicated trades going two, three times a week for years. Uh, but that was our very first trade, a real straightforward trade. So I ended up, you know, a couple hours later, I ended up owning this. And he ended up owning this, and uh, I don't know. Verdict, verdicts out who uh, who was right. I I, I kind of think maybe he had better taste um, because the yesterday and today album, albeit pretty heavy, um, is uh, is possibly not as well regarded as a Virgin Killer in the in the canons of hard rock history. Um, but yeah, there, there's those guys looking pretty heavy, right? Oh yeah, all dead except for one, no. Dave Manichetti, last man standing, right? the the only signature i've got i've never met any of those other guys um but uh Plane so of there, flying v which you've never seen him play since right yeah was well, that true yeah okay I've, interesting i've never seen him with a flying v ever yeah. other than now that i'm covered yeah there is a flying and, and every time you got you got to put drummers in these shots they always look stupid right <laughs> you know the oh, always the, the guitar side. players always get to hold their guitars and the drum drummers just like oh here's my sticks <laughs> whatever right so. i got no shirt on i got silly short shorts and long socks. yeah yeah so there you go here's my fifth one <laughs> that's a that's a cool one and you know it's funny because uh i'm sure there's gonna be plenty of people commenting that that are the original virgin killer album cover is anything but a great album cover right i mean the yeah original, well this is domestic canadian right yeah so i don't know what they were thinking American with the other version too, yeah. right so yeah i didn't see that other one for years <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, I know, right? I remember when I first saw it, I was horrified. I'm like, yeah. they really actually <laughs> released that at some point in time, yeah, somewhere yeah. in this world? Yeah. What were they thinking? Oh, man. All right. So my next one is uh, is one of those stories where I saw this, didn't buy it, and kept... You ever do this? I'm sure you did this, where you, you would go, and, and this is pre license right pre-driving you know we would go my parents would take us uh, or my mother or whatever if my dad was working would take us to the mall and in the mall it was like a this is back pre-galleria days right so in the mall you had uh, and we had a basement there was the basement to the orange plaza mall and in the basement you had maybe a half a dozen stores and down there was this place called record world it was the big record shop back in the day and uh, so we would go to the mall and sometimes if dad was working late, mom would take us out to the mall and we'd go eat at this little Chinese cafeteria place, right? And then she'd allow us to kind of walk around the mall for a bit. So I would go into Record World and I would start looking around. And I remember seeing this album and I was like, oh, that looks pretty cool. I have no idea who the band is, um, but it's a live shot on the front and it's got like smoke and dry ice and lots of lights and they look pretty cool. And one guy looks like he's playing a double neck guitar and I'm like, wow. Oh. I didn't buy it. And I went back a couple of weeks later and I was buying other stuff. And I looked at that album again and I was like, yeah, that looks pretty cool. I didn't buy it. Yeah. The third time was a charm though. I said, you know what? I'm going to take a chance on this album. I don't know who the hell Genesis is, but I absolutely love that album cover. And even yeah. on the back, I mean, they look like a big deal. I don't know what kind of music they play. I mean, Squonk, The Carpet Crawl, Firth of Fifth, what does that even mean, right? Uh, Lamb lies down on Broadway. Is that New York City? I don't know. Uh, Supper's ready. I, I don't know any, anything about this. It sounds kind of interesting, yeah. though. And I brought it home, and I was like, oh, this is kind of cool and kind of different because I was listening to you know, a bit more rock and stuff at the time. But this was kind of one of my first introductions to what we now know as progressive rock. I was listening to Kansas and I guess ELO, sort of proggy, right? But I, I hadn't yet bought my first Yes album. So this was kind of like really my first introduction to British prog rock and I loved it. And of course you open it up and I don't even remember if the CD has any of those pictures in there. Probably not, no, of course not. But anyway, in the, the, the gatefold of the LP, you had all these wonderful color live shots of the band and I was like, amazing. And again, I was a sucker for really cool artwork and live shots. And to me, I had no clue who Genesis was because uh, they really weren't uh, at the time, this was, you know, 77 or something. They really weren't a big deal here in, in the States um, yet. And uh, I took that chance and it was a winner. Cool, wicked. Boy, when you, were, when you were talking about it before you brought it up, I was trying to guess what record you were talking about because you know how we get abused for not saying the title. I'm thinking, did I say the title soon enough? Or, but I, I thought you were talking about the American cover of Triumph Rock and Roll Machine because you were kind oh, of describing I'm thinking, well, that would have been that another good about? one. Yeah, because yeah, I bought that one without having any clue who they were. That was pre-Allied Forces, yes. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that was a pretty wicked album cover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, so I've, I've got just two uh, two honorable mentions and these, these will be quick. Um because I don't have much of a story about them, but uh, Dictators Manifest Destiny, I got in uh, Black Swan Records in, uh, in Vancouver. Um, and uh, I'm actually talking to Andy for their new, they got a couple of new singles out. So I'm going to talk to them again. Always love the Dictators, one of my favorite bands. But yeah, I just remember that shot. They looked amazing, except Andy is over here looking kind of mod in his, uh, in his uh, you know, uh, sport jacket and jeans and he's playing keyboards, thick of keyboards. That's bad. Don't don't want keyboard, but <laughs> I remember thinking one of the cool things about this, besides you know that's a that's a Cantness album cover, but I always thought it was cool the the type style for the uh, for the songs. It made them look really epic and larger than life, right? Yeah. And uh, you know, no seeing Search and Destroy on here, uh, Young Fast Scientific. It, it looked like the song titles were heavy enough that this was going to be heavy, but uh, oddly enough. Not a not a crazy heavy album. It's it's a little heavy, uh, and and you know liked it. I mean, it's one of my favorite albums of all time. Now, didn't love it at the time because it wasn't super heavy. But uh, so that's one of those sight unseen. And then my other one is a Spokane story original uh, original location or no second location of Magic Mushroom. Uh, this was in the delete bin. You know, you, you put something like that on the cover, it's going to end up in the delete bin pretty fast, right? But uh, uh, yeah, it looked 
look fairly heavy, but 1977, an album cover like this could easily be not, not a heavy album, right? And then you look at the band and it's like, okay, they look pretty heavy. And I remember thinking, um, what was it here? I, I remember uh, one of the big things that made me buy this was the bass player's name was Jimmy Iomi. So I'm thinking, oh, that's got to be Tony's brother. So it's probably going to be heavy, right? You know, so, uh, and then the song title was pretty name. heavy. <laughs> Yeah. So a song tells side one was Desperation Warrior Rock City Overdrive. I thought, OK, that's that's probably going to be heavy. Right. But it was it was an indie. Uh, it was an indie. And um, this is not my original version because it's on Attic. Uh, so Attic was a Canadian label and then all the riot stuff came out on Attic. But my original version was uh, would have been the indie version. Uh, bought out of a delete bin in Spokane got this home and it was yeah we 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 loved it um, we thought they were a pretty good band not amazing at this point amazing came with the next one I read it in 1979 but this was a pretty good album too so there you go two honorable mentions very cool yeah I um I heard like someone in the parking lot of high school play uh a song from fire down under and I had never heard a riot before. And I heard that one right. song and went out and bought that album like immediately afterwards. So yeah. that for me was sort of, sort of qualifies here. But yeah. Yeah. Um, so this one, I, I never heard of Fate's Warning at all, yeah. but I was absolutely, absolutely crushed by that album cover, crushed in a good way, I'm saying. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this is during a time period where all these bands are popping up all over the place. And, you know, you had no choice but to take a take a chance on something. And, you know, thankfully, I had some pretty cool heavy metal record shops around here at the time where I would see this sitting up on the wall and I'd be like, what's the deal with that? And they'd be like, really good check it out. And I'm like, okay, I'll buy it. And I brought it home. And I was like, holy cow, listen to that singer. This is kind of like Iron Maiden, but really complicated and all that kind of stuff yeah. and kind of like queens right but heavier and uh yeah i mean and now we you know looking back this is one of the most important albums in the history of progressive metal so yeah. classic johannes buddy of ours right absolutely johannes yeah. right one of his uh one of his uh key key works from the early days yeah and if people are interested i i did an interview with johannes uh well, i don't know about a month and a half ago and he talked in great detail about the creation of this album cover and you know working with the band and all that kind of stuff so um so this one, this, the more I, as I was just thinking about it, like a minute ago, this one kind of doesn't fit because I had just seen the band live open it up for Ozzy Osbourne's Blizzard of Oz. And I had never heard them before that day, but they were so damn loud. It's not like I left that show remembering anything they did because they played like a 35 minute set and it was just so brutal. I was like, what was that? But I went out like a week later and I bought Overkill by Motorhead. <laughs> and I really dug it. And I was thinking, wow, this is a little more not as loud and almost offensive to your ears as they were live on stage and thinking what a really great album this is. And that started my whole love affair with Motorhead. But that, that night at the Mid Hudson Civic Center in Poughkeepsie, New York, opening up for Ozzy, I, I, I was not prepared for that assault of decibels that we got from Motorhead. But I, I was intrigued enough to go out and buy this. And I did. So this one's kind of cheating a little bit. But uh, I mean, even you know what, even if I hadn't seen them at that concert, I probably would have bought this if I saw it. Because yeah. that is, to me, a great, that is a heavy metal album cover. That if you're a fan, how can you not buy that? How can you not be intrigued what that's all about? Yeah, yeah my, my story with that one is, uh, <clears throat> I, I totally remember, like I already had the debut, but I remember going to Strawberry Jams and flipping through the racks and seeing that and seeing Motorhead in that impressive display of uh, illustrated in color for the first time, right? Because Motorhead's just black and white yeah. um, and just freaking out. And I remember jumping up and up and almost hitting my head on a, on a beam that they have these big, massive wood beams there and uh, and just freaking out seeing that for the first time. And, and I mean, it's an amazing piece of artwork. And then, you know, you got the guys in the band on the back. Yeah. And if I remember correctly, I'm pretty sure my copy was white vinyl, if I remember correctly. Uh, Might have been... Uh, there, was, there was blue and red. Uh, Bomber... My bomber is still, well, you know, it's not going to change color on me, but <laughs> my bomber is still the blue one, I think. White. Interesting. I'm not. Maybe it was know. blue. I know it was a, it was a different color. I just red. don't remember exactly what it was. Yellow? Could it have been yellow? Uh, it might have been. Blue, red. 
Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I just, I, I, I do remember when that. Uh, when Did you that... ever have pink? I had, a, I had a, I had a rare like ELO release that was like it was like a British import, really oh, early. Man. It was like from the the very first incarnation of ELO, and it was on pink vinyl. I wow. That up, I'm like, what in the world is this? Yeah, I'm yeah. Happy for it. Never saw it again after that either. My Power Age was the Canadian red vinyl. My my Hemispheres was the Canadian red vinyl. Oh wow, right. pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's a so whole other know. show there maybe right <laughs> that's right that's right yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there you have it everybody so uh in the comments below let us know what some of those albums are that you bought where you were totally impressed by the album cover or maybe the back cover never heard of the band before but took it home listened to it and you were pleasantly surprised mm -hmm. and hopefully that started up a love affair with that band that uh, lasts to this day but uh who knows? So uh, there you have it, Martin. You want to plug some stuff that's uh, coming in? That's uh, your yeah. Out well, your I heap's going to get here eventually. That's a, that's a coffee table book, but still, the current volumes out are uh, are the third, the last in the trilogy, the the rush driven book, the sweet book, the angel book, the flaming telepaths book, and all that's at uh, martinpopoff.com. Cool. Did you get my order for the rush book? Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. It's already sent. Oh. Perfect. Yeah. I'm anxiously awaiting that. So uh, yeah. if you haven't put in your order for that third Rush Book of Martin, please do so. What a great series. So uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on the Mighty YouTube all the damn time. Coming up this weekend, we've got uh, Rich Catino on Sunday. He and I are going to be speaking of great album covers. We, he and I are going to be ranking the catalog of new wave of British heavy metal legends uh, praying mantis so that is coming up on sunday we've got the hudson valley squares on monday in the Prague seat on tuesday monsters den on thursday all of the shows sprinkled around between those those are our set in stone uh shows that happen you know on those specific nights but we've got all sorts of stuff in the works for next week as well so stay tuned for all that and uh martin will be back here next friday as well so uh we'll look forward to seeing him then for martin popoff i am p pardo have a good weekend everybody